let's get to the monthly report. 2024, uh, this is, <laughs> the year's gonna go down in the books. There's a lot of stuff going on. Like, we're, we're basically in the midst of another 3.0 era, minus the horrible drought. We kind of had a drought last year, but now we are, we're flowing, we're good. We didn't get monthly reports back during 3.0. We didn't get regular updates back during 3.0. So it's better than it was back then, but in terms of how much it's changing, in my opinion, we're right back into the uh, lovely year of 2018, including the big tech overhauls with OCS and stuff. So this monthly report's got a lot of that stuff in it. It's got some ship stuff, ships you know and love, as well as some secrets, and we get to finally talk some more cargo. Let's start with the AI section though. In March, AI features continued to fix bugs and make improvements to human combat and other AI behaviors, saying, one particular bug threatened to become our new standing on chairs issue. That being a bug that has a lot of individual causes, so can keep cropping up in different situations. So like with that issue, we adopted a belt and braces approach that should eliminate it, even if it, even if new causes crop up in the future. The standing on chairs thing, everybody, everybody knows that. And actually, um, I'm always going to take the chance to, you know, if there's, there's always a good chance for a plug. Hello, we're going back to a video I made last year. This one goes over this in in great detail. Um, it's actually a video that was, there's actually a video that was spawned by uh, my conversation with Yamix, who I do use in, in the intro to kind of introduce the idea. But the whole video is about why the game continues to remain buggy and why a lot of them don't get fixed. Um, among some of those things that comes up is, is this, that some bugs get caused by multiple things that come up because of different things changing in other places in the game. It just continued to keep happening. Anyways, let's continue. AI Tech. Last month, AI Tech focused on finalizing and polishing features for Alpha 323 alongside optimizations for existing systems. For example, work on planetary navigation was completed with the team now able to generate navigation meshes over the entire planet. To achieve this, the devs used the same concepts the physics and planetary tech teams used for representing planet terrain patches. Compared to the previous implementations, where planet navigation tiles were represented as a cube or parallelopiped or para parallel pipe par parallelopiped as used in traditional navigation volumes. I swear I've seen this word before, but I cannot. <laughs> parallel I want to say parallelograph or something. New method uses a volume with a skewed square rhombus base. While this brings new challenges, such as two how two neighboring triangular navigation tiles will connect, it allows a navigation mesh to be generated everywhere and on all types of planets and moons. Holy crap, that was a paragraph, right? That was multiple sentences. I don't think I took enough breaths there. Check this out. We have the footage. You know if there's a topic, we've got the footage, right? What do you think it is? I'm thinking AI navigation. Here is the navigation mesh being produced. This is a while ago. This is when they first implemented it. This is really what they're talking about though. The planet basically can get painted with a layer of information that tells AI where they can and cannot walk. And so what they're saying here is that they're just changing the, the shape in which these meshes are created. And it now allows them to produce them all over the planet, including at the poles, which was a difficult process for them before. For Boyd's, ha, the old boys, the team continued to implement new rules and finalize synchronization between the server and clients. They also worked on additional iterations with design and polish, polished the feature for release. I wonder what Boyd's were getting. We have a bird in game. They just sneakily peek lead it. Star Citizen sneakily peekly. So this is, um, I think this is the bird that we just got or like a variation of it. Obviously, that what they they made this much bigger than a Boyd would be. A Boyd is kind of like a a sprite almost in the game. It's not something you really interact with. Whereas this is something that's connected to missions. It has craftable ingredients that are used for crafting. So this isn't necessarily what they talk about when they're talking about Boyds. So I do wonder what they're bringing in on that aspect. AI Tech iterated on new ship behaviors with design. With the aim of greatly improving the AI combat experience, substantial improvements were made to the aiming control system for ships and turrets, and to perception thanks to the addition of support for missile, d missile detection. Missile. Got that missile detection. Always happy to hear about improved AI 
in all parts of the game. AI is probably what's going to end up making the game feel much more alive when it actually works as we would expect. Right now it's painful to see and doesn't work great because of server stuff. There are also times when it seems like it doesn't work great despite server stuff too, so we'll have to see where this all goes. But I, I'm hearing rumors that the ship AI and FPS AI are pretty good combat wise. What I want to see more of very, very soon is non AI or non combat AI being worked on, social AI being worked on. Like, what are, what are non combat focused AI spaceships in the verse going to be doing? Are they going to be chattering on open voice comms? Are they going to be flying around the space stations willy nilly or are they going point a point b all the time like we we still don't have a lot of insight into the development side of that just the design side which you know that we, we've seen with things like quantum and some of the some of the videos that they've released on that topic i mean i could even show you um probably ai ship might bring something up yeah so like they've definitely been showing us what they want to do with AI flying ships coming into outpost. <laughs> Obviously this AI is still in the learning phase. Um, throwing out their landing gear, landing in a free spot, like oh, this stuff is good. And we've seen a little bit of it, but I would definitely like to hear more from the um, combined design and, and development side. Elsewhere improvements were made to the navigation link system to reduce the computation cost over a frame by better utilizing the new navigation anchors concept. Subsumption loading logic improvements were also submitted that will more clearly show possible, possible problems with the data so the designers can fix them sooner. Y'all know about subsumption. It's like a freaking tradition at this point. Subsumption. Open it up. There we go. Drop it. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I just, it's, it's, I feel like we do this every single month. Subsumption is like the most predictable topic in the whole month report. So every month we have a, a chance to come back and be like, Subsumption is this. It's basically the, the logic of missions and AI. It's a, it's a flow path, flow chart, flow chart. And it can, determine, you know, when this thing happens, something else happens. If this, then that. If this, then that. In terms of how the AI in the game and the missions that they are hooked to run. So, very powerful tool. Something that they've been working on for a while. This is the 2023 version of it. All the way back here, we have the, I think this is 20, this is also 2023. I could have sworn I had like a 2020 video clip of this somewhere. Maybe not. There we go. These are the old ones. So I don't even know when this is from, but like you can see it was it was pretty similar back then. On the AI tool side, the team continued to improve and iterate on Apollo. That is the subsumption editor, what we just talked about. This included implementing a new version of the sticky header tree that shows a better representation of files and folders with behaviors and missions. On to the animation team. Uh, didn't do too much. They usually have a pretty short one on here, actually. They've been working on the space cow, a medium-sized bird, a predator wolf-like creature, as well as several new vehicles, entrance, animations. I'm, I think, I'm assuming these are the actual creatures we already see. This being the Copion and this being the Mar, whatever this is. Mar, Marion, Marion, Mar, Marlin, Merrick, the Merrick. I don't know if those are what they're referring to here or if these are two additional creatures, but they, the, you know, both the creatures we know do kind of fit these descriptions. So I'll assume they are. We still got a space cow on the way, though. Love those space cow animations. All right, art on the character side, folks. Let's go. In March, the character art team completed a range of branded racing flight suits and continued working on outfits for the Headhunters gang. The freaking Headhunters gang. Oh my God, I swear I said this probably last summer. If we hear about the headhunters one more time, I will kill them all in game. Luckily by now we've we've seen the actual headhunters, so I'm okay with them continuing to mention it because I can go and reference this stuff for you guys now. Which is what we like to do. This is how monthly reports go. Here you are. A look at the headhunters gang and what they've been working on with it.
lip dust. Like eye, lip, and nose dust. But, oh no, it's the tattoo, sorry. Er, uh, butt customization. All right, so that's the Headhunters. Um, just for some you know, context as to when we're reading these monthly reports, that's who they're talking about. It is a gang in... I think they're, they operate in multiple systems. Hold on. Where are they based? Headhunters gang, Wasteland vibe, uh, located in Pyro, but offers completely different frontier aesthetic. So it says they're located in Pyro right now, but I do believe they are also in a couple of other star systems. So we might see them elsewhere in the game, but they are coming in for the Pyro system. They uh, have armor fabricated from metal and bone. I don't know what kind of missions they prefer to go with, but I'm consuming with the bones and the skulls and the stuff. They're kind of trying to say, hey, we're bad guys. We're, we're, we're violent. I don't think your claim jumpers are putting skulls on their chest. That would might send the wrong message. Art on the engine side. March saw progress on the RSI Zeus. Gray box was completed and all functionality has been validated. Da, 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 da. With the ship currently in the beauty and polish stage, habitation and the central hallways made significant progress and are approaching completion. While the cargo hold continues to progress with the loading ramps, main piston structure improving rapidly, as well as the ramp interior and exterior. Oh, we got to make sure to check in on that main loading ramp piston structure. It's an interesting detail to call out. The landing gear is nearly complete and the overall exterior continues to progress too. Let's, let's, we, why don't we check out what the RSI Zeus looks like? I know a lot of you are foaming at the mouth for this one. It is a, it's a, I don't blame you. It's a solid ship. Um, and it's a good size. It's looking like it's going to be really nice for two, three, maybe four people to skedaddle battle around in the game under different types of gameplay. You're going to have a little bit of marketing speech mixed in here, but this is a good look at the game or at the ship in white box. This is months, months prior to where we are right now. So the ship is well past this, but here's at least this should give you some idea of what it is. Concept. We're not just going to show you some images. The Zeus is actually an act of white, do white box development right now. Do you just want to have a look? Yeah! Shall we? Yeah. Eh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so as you guys have seen with the Spirit and with the many ships we've released thus far, our ships can, when they're finished, look absolutely gorgeous. But before any of them get to that point, they have to grow through a very specific development process. And this is the first stage in that process. We call this white box. At this point, we've taken the concept, ripped it to shreds, and then reassembled it and plugged it all back together within the editor so that we can get a real good look at what players are gonna see when they finally get this game. At this stage, with the Zeus, we've already ripped out all the thrusters, we've ripped out the landing gear, the turret, the seats, the beds, all of the interior spaces, plugged those guys back in, and we have what you see here. So again, the beginning of the process. At this point, we're able to jump in, start throwing in cargo, interacting with doors, getting in and out of beds, maybe in and out of toilets, and just getting an overall sense of what it feels like to interact with the vehicle. And it is very common that in this stage, we will make some adjustments from the original plan. As an example, on this ship, We've just made the decision to expand the center corridor, add a little bit more space to the rooms. And as a result, that's going to make it much smoother experience for players to traverse the, in the, the interior of the ship, as well as for AI to traverse the interior of the ship. We've also expanded the main airlock that leads to the enter exit ladder. And up here in the cockpit, we've separated the co-pilot seats a tad bit just to allow players to get in. That is a, a tight, this is a tight fit. For three people, this looks almost, this looks just a little bit bigger than the Mantis 
Um, maybe, maybe I'm just not getting a good perspective here, but I honestly, I feel like this looks not that much wider than the Mantis, which is a one person cockpit. So I'll be interested to see, I, I'm, it doesn't look like these seats move forward. So I guess they're keeping them kind of vertically displaced as well as horizontally to, to give them more space. Man, as many people in the front though, as, as a, co um, a constellation, the, idea of three a three person probably four person ship eh, three three person i don't think you have a, any you don't have any turrets on the regular one do you this is probably a comfortable three person ship if you keep engineering and uh defense and logistics you know between the three of you this is going to be an interesting ship to see how it works i don't know if we have any others that really fit this so efficiently i like it because the freelancer would be probably the main competitor to this um and i guess yeah it does it does i i'll have to we have to do like a direct comparison between the freelancer and this when it comes out easier so with white box not the prettiest stage in the process but it is essential that we nail this because it means we'll be able to deliver a beautiful ship that is also extremely fun to play so that is the Zeus. That's at least what they were doing on it back then. And if you want to see the, like the finished, so what the what it looks like um, in the concept and the vertical stabilizers, we also work to maintain the silhouette of the original. Then uh, the interior is it's it looks really well designed. It's compact. They can fit a lot into this thing. This thing is about the same size as a Spirit. Um, the the Crusader Spirit. So, you know, the Crusader Spirit is a hallway, a cockpit, and a back bay here for the C1. This thing in the same amount of size is able to fit all these, all this stuff. And then on this, on this model, We've also added big cargo. Capacity to the base of the wings. It, all, it gets VTOL thrusters and huge cargo there capacity. There is an absolutely massive rear to it compared to the others. A massive the rear. areas have been massively pushed so that you don't get much space, but we can get way more cargo in. It actually has four times the cargo capacity of the S coming in at 128 SUs of cargo. That's a lot for this being the same size just about as a Spirit, about 45 meters long. So good ship. It's going to be an interesting one. Good for small groups of friends. If you've got a friend that you know you're going to play Star Citizen with um, and, you know, I know you might not plan to do that all the time, but trust me, it's going to be a much more fun game if you can bring somebody along every once in a while. That'll be a good ship to work towards. We'll, we'll see how it comes about. But folks, just because this is saying gray box completed and stuff, don't, it doesn't mean they're gonna release this right away. They might hang, they might hang on to this for a little while um, to release with 4.0. It might come out at CitizenCon. Um, I don't think this is gonna be a, 323 patch uh like i don't think this will be released in the 3.23 range i think this is going to be later on in the year still cockpit window looks kind of weird with so much glass hey man what do you got against glass we're good friends it, it protects me keeps the wind out of my face i can see through it good relationship okay the anvil legionnaire is white box complete <laughs> This is an interesting ship. Oh, Jesus. Sorry, I got really angry there. This is an interesting ship. The Legionnaire is, I think, arguably the the kind of most awkward ship in the game, in my opinion. Um, because it feels like it sits in a role that most ships could do. They made this thing purpose-built for docking Master and boarding. Around. Okay, we don't need all that. Uh, they made this thing purpose-built for docking and boarding, right? But other ships can also dock. So then this thing is also purpose-built, oh my God, to hack into things. But then you can also hack from other things. So developing this, they're gonna, it, it, I almost think that they're building hacking and boarding around what this ship is based on. And I hope that doesn't make it all too weird what i'm trying to say is i hope this ship excels at boarding it doesn't dominate it's not the only thing that can do it right they they talk about how with this ship the main thing you get out of it is the ability to hack another ship to accept your docking approval 
that's fine. As long as you can also just go to that docking collar and like blow it open or something with another ship, right? So I, I hope that that's the case. I look forward to seeing how they make this gameplay feasible. But this is a weird ship. Here's here's just like a little bit of talk about what the heck it is and how it works. It's in white box. So remember, um, that means that hacking and boarding gameplay is probably getting a step up sometime later this year. I'm, I'm going to assume it's 4.0. Anyways, here it is. Genev fills a, a gap in our lineup for both more lawful and less lawful careers where you need to take charge of another person's ships. Traditional flow for ship to ship docking is the, the person who wants to dock to the other ship requests it from the parent ship and it's on the parent ship's uh, pilot to accept or deny that. Whereas the Legionnaire has on board uh, hacking abilities in the hacking minigame to perhaps forcibly override that uh, acceptance and allowing it uh, to happen instead. For players that are on the, the, the lawful side, um, its prime use is bounty hunting. For those perhaps with more, more military focus, it is like Anvil's dedicated military boarding ship. Uh, and for those on the other side of the spectrum, it, piracy is its main, main role. So you are there able to uh, attach and board other ships and take their crew goods or ship itself. That's, that's the Anvil Legionnaire. Uh, looking forward to this one because it's a, a ship that appeals to, to both sides of the law. Uh, it brings with it uh, a new side to an existing gameplay loop or existing gameplay loops. It expands upon them. And it's something that I know a lot of players have been waiting for a long time is that the ability to board other ships uh, forcibly because it's sort of, it takes away that safety a lot of players have at the moment where well, I'm, I'm safe on my ship. No one's coming on here without uh, without destroying me. Uh, so people are really going to have to start thinking twice when these things hit the persistent universe. This is going to be a another hot point for the PvP conversation, I think. People are going to be terrified of just constantly getting boarded, but I, I think it's going to be limited by things like shields. Uh, obviously, this ship's going to be incredibly vulnerable if it is trying to board somebody else. I, I don't think that forceful boarding is going to be a problem unless you get, like, you're attacked by a gang, right? Who's brought themselves a quantum dampener and all this stuff. And this, this again, factors into, like, with damage systems changing, ships aren't going to blow up. So everybody's like, oh, why would we ever board a ship when they all just die immediately? They're, they're not going to. Uh, pretty soon they're not going to. You're rarely going to just blow up. Most of the time your ship will just get disabled and you'll have to call for a beacon for help. You'll have to ask for repair or something. Somebody will have to come out and get you. You get your ship repaired or you get towed back to a station. Like there's a whole deluge, deluge of things that can happen out of the verse that are going to diversify things a lot. But at the same time, man, with the way that people are reacting to like things like engineering, uh, people are very hesitant at this game getting deeper in this sense and i know a lot of that is because people think it's going to be monotonous kind of gameplay but yeah there's a lot of, there's a lot of conversation there you'd say well that's because this is the first iteration of that gameplay they're getting in the basics and they want to build upon that to make it better and then the response is well they need to stop giving us alpha stuff it's been 10 years and it's it's a circle of conversation um but i do hope that while I worry about how this will come into the game, ultimately I hope it comes in and it helps to complicate experiences and make more variation for gameplay. That's my bottom line. More choices. The team's work on the resource network began with 10 ships nearing completion. Nice. Nearing completion is good. It's only 10 ships, but it's good. We're working, we're getting there. Say maybe, hopefully, if they can get 50 50 ships in i don't know do they want to have all the ships done for engineering by 4.0 what's the plan there some of which of them uh received the update list of ship items following gameplay validation relay locations will be polished update work on a legacy ship continued too with updates to the dash cockpit and some exterior housings wonder what the legacy ship is and i wonder if they're insinuating it is the rsi ship or if this is the uh this might be the zeus that they're showing us here 
What's the file name? Art ships. <laughs> All right, core gameplay. This is the most exciting time. Of, this is the most exciting part of the monthly report now because they've just combined all the exciting teams into one section. And it's going to take us a while. Last month, the gameplay team, my friends, the gameplay team. Uh, it successfully passed the go no go gates for procedural recoil, new scopes, dynamic crosshairs, and reload improvements. Further bug fixing is currently ongoing for these deliverables. All of these are pretty uncontroversial dynamic crosshairs gets people a little bit but that one is disableable um i think the biggest things that people are not happy about with the fps stuff right now are the um i guess it's the the scopes kind of the new scopes and the view they give and uh hit markers i think progress was also made on ammo repooling including network optimizations and bug fixing. The looting UI was also updated to support the way ammo is repooled, while reload animations now play at the correct time following the rummage animation. I don't like the rummage animation, but I'll be okay with it as long as we can still physically interact with objects when we're looting. What I mean by that is if you watch the way that um, looting works, cool FPS combat and see stealth, if he which has seen shows a suite of improvements from improving They don't even show the animation here. Um, I don't know if I have a good video of it. When you do use this looting screen, basically it just shows your character kind of reaching their hand out to, to emphasize that you're picking something up, which is cool, that's fine. Um, but I do want to make sure that we're still getting that physical interaction. They physicalized all the objects on the body. They spent a lot of time doing it and they put a lot of emphasis on the fact that they were doing it. So I do hope that is something they still continue to do with the actual physical interaction system. Work, can, work continued on pre-production for base building with gameplay features working closely with art and design to refine requirements and define metrics. Base building, a topic I did not expect to be talking about in 2024, to be honest. Let's go listen to what they had to say about base building because there was a lot. We, we still have not done a deep dive on this topic. I'm still waiting for a little bit more info to come back on this and I need to definitely get myself back into the archives to see what kind of stuff they used to say about base building back in the day but um at least we do have a pretty lengthy segment on it here so i'll let you guys listen to a little bit of this and hear what they have planned for base building because it's going to be a big part of star citizen going forward listen in go but we feel it's the future of star citizen and it's the actual the culmination of multiple different game systems coming together so why don't you play the video All that came up because of it said land claim down there and people realized this was base building.
I get so many satisfactory vibes from like the song here. <laughs> and then like this visual, there's like a visual up here. This one, we just like also getting satisfactory vibes. Ah, man. Okay. Um, let's go through the important parts here. Talk about a little bit of crafting. Or is it to be off grid and be completely self-sufficient? Yep. So with that, with your prep and everything like that, we've got blueprints. So the, the recipes, everything in the game is fabricated from a blueprint. Players acquire blueprints via reputation rewards, um, missions, or rare NPCs. With any blueprint, you can actually do research on it and then create different variations. With materials ranging from the common to ultra rare, you might find them at the local shop or have to travel around the universe to collect them. Unrefined, refined, simple materials, or even complex components will all go into the fabrication. With this, then you got location, location, location. First area is high security, so you must purchase the land. The base is actually invulnerable because of the planetary shield tech. A security will show up to protect it as well. You pay for the privilege, you're taxed. So at this point, um, you won't have the best resources available, you won't have access to the best resources available on the planet. If you don't pay your taxes, the shields will go away after a period of time, and the base will become derelict and will collapse. But this is low risk, low reward. Then you've got low security. So again, you must purchase the land. It's owned by an independent corp, gang, or faction. Again, you don't have access to all the best resources on the planet. The base is vulnerable. AI NPCs will show up and protect the base if it's attacked. The protection will escalate. Um, over time. Player can also build defenses to help mitigate this as well, and then it's medium reward, medium risk. Then you've got lawless. So this is no protection other than what you build. There's shields, anti-air. Players can disable the shields by getting close to them. Now, and see, that sounds, that sounds like your end game DayZ Rust kind of gameplay, is the no security. Everything else here sounds like it's mainly going to be i guess low security is one thing high security sounds like it's all going to be pretty by the books like pretty standard you got a place and you're it's not going to be at risk you know they might say it's at risk but it's not at risk low security sounds like it's kind of a little bit more risky and that'll be where a lot of people probably spend their time places like in nix and maybe even magnus and and the offshoots of like Terra, I don't know, or, or Stanton maybe. No security though, that sounds like the play, the stuff that people are like scared of. Getting bombed all the time, getting attacked while you're offline, that kind of stuff. And I think they're really going to go out of their way to make sure they make these very, very distinct because clearly they want a lot of people who are really casual to put a lot of time into base building in this game. This is going to be one of their cash cows. The cosmetics you can do with base building is going to be crazy in this game. Base building, hangar customization, ship customization, a lot of it. So... I think they're going to protect the people who want to do this protected. They're going to give the people who want the more wild side of this, the craziness that they're looking for. High risk, high reward. Since there's no taxes, no protection fees, you get a high return on the resources that you collect. Now, there's some cross shard and server meshing considerations that will we'll kind of adjust this design in the future, but we'll get into that later once, we, once we're really building it. So from here, you've got the tools, so this is what we would consider a surveyor. Um, with this, we want to actually cater to everybody's play style, whether you're solo or in an org. With this, you've got different buildings that you can produce, from small, medium to large, to XRL, or XL. So with the surveyor tool, you can only build the small buildings. With a vehicle, you can build small and medium-sized buildings. With the Galaxy, you can build small to large structures. And then, obviously, with the Pioneer. Pioneer can do it all. And it still works as a mobile base. And we'll uh, talk about some of the more expanded features that we're adding to it in, in later on. So, um, and then it's also, we're exploring what can be done in space, not just on the planet. So from here, you set off on your journey. So with the land claim, 
You put your tool down where you want, you launch the drone that is built into the machine, and then from there, this allows the player to access the base building and also land claim mode. With the land claim modes, the player can actually change the size and position of what, what area they want to claim, and it also shows you the cost and taxes associated with it. If it's in a taxable zone and you don't own the land, this interface will default to it. So if you own the land or it's in a lawless area, it will automatically go to the base building mode. So with the overhead view of the land, you can actually place down buildings exactly where you want. You can see the resources beneath the surface. And then you can also place multiple buildings before you actually build. So you can see how it will all kind of come together. You'll see the resources that are needed for it. And then I'm going to jump forward a little bit here. Just talk about some of the more interior stuff. There's not too much crunchy detail. This is mostly a design talk, but it does give an idea of their intention. And now you can actually fill the room the way that you want to fill it. So furnishings can be purchased at different locations, or they can actually be fabricated. You can do that via first person or in a dedicated mode in the surveyor's tool. With that, you've got different types of buildings. So you've got utility style, which would be garages, freight elevators, landing pads, storefronts. And then you've got extractors. So with, re with extractors, we want to make sure that nothing in regards to resource gathering is fully automated. A, player, a level of player engagement is always needed. So as Nick talked about before, there are different types of commodities, radioactive, perishable, et cetera. What you'll be doing is pulling out full containers. Then from there, it'll be repairing, or there's wear and tear associated with it, or even misfires like you saw in Thorsten's talk and Guillermo's talk yesterday. There's also upgrade paths for making them more efficient or resilient. Power generators. So with different types of power generators, there, there'll be some that are more cost effective as well as effective in different areas. Solar panels will not always work in darkness. Fuel generators will need to be filled up every now and then, and then batteries to store excess power. Then you've got producers. So things that will require the players to combine different resources to produce new items. And then you've got defense. So anti-air, anti-personnel, and then shield generators. And then the big one. We start development Q1. So. OK. That's and me. that's where we come in. Thank that you. was kind of the craziness that people were like, wait, what? You're going to start development on this? Doesn't mean they're going to finish development in Q1, but we are. Technically, this is this is the report on Q1, right? So what is it that they said about base building here? Uh, where are the where the f were we? <laughs> uh, here we go. Work continued on pre-production for base building with gameplay features working closely with art and design to refine requirements and define metrics. Pre-production. I, I don't know. Start starts pre-development in Q1 2024. What does it mean? Who knows? I don't think we should place too much emphasis on the idea that it starts development in Q1 2024. That means literally nothing for when we're going to see it in the game. It just means that they're working on it, which, don't get me wrong, on its own is a big deal. The fact that they're working on base building, it could mean it's two years out, but working on it <laughs> means the design docs are down, the engineering is ongoing, and anything that they are working on gameplay related at this point is being built with game base building in mind. So all of the engineering systems they're building, the resource network stuff, the maelstrom stuff, all those damage systems, all the metrics that they're using and different stuff is all getting factored into base building, which is good, but we don't know when it's coming. So we'll keep an eye on this. I'm sure we're gonna see it in monthly reports for the next 1200 months, um, but I'm excited to see how that changes at least over the months. Testing in Q2, Q3 maybe, I think, I don't, I'm not expecting to see anything on this, at least until like 4.1, 4.2. The team then added different colored loot screens depending on whether the, the player is looting an enemy, friendly, or neutral entity. They also added a button to go from the inventory to the loot screen and a pop-up window when an item swap can't be performed. They also allowed for separate loot screen styles between the visor and lens. That's solid. Regarding the visor and lens, the conversion of on-screen chat to building blocks was completed. The loot screen's interesting, I like it. Um, it feels pretty nice and polished. I like that there's different colors for different types of entities and the button to get from the inventory to the loot screen is nice. It does, it is, it is very much 
these are all big shifts for the game so i understand why people feel a little anxious about the way the inventory is changing the the ui is changing it's definitely more gamey feeling i'm not sure if that's a bad thing though i like having a quick light ui that is fairly intuitive i think and straightforward um with sound effects a little ding 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 while you're using it that's nice good shit, man the team then converted more markers to the new system, including navigation, ships, player, party, mar party members, missions, and landing pads. I don't like the AR markers. I like their animations. I like that they're a little eye-catching. They have different colors. I'm down for all that, but they are too shapely. shapely. Um, they're 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 they've got they're kind of chunky. They feel a little bit unpolished. They feel like like there's almost outer glow on them. Like they're not the the, the outline of them is not clear cut i like a very minimal simple style that's that's just what i like other people might like the new style again i think it's still an upgrade from what we had before but i hope that they dial those icons in a little bit more for eva the devs unblocked animation content to support weapon customization and two-handed carry to work with the new eva system they also provided support for backward and sideways flying animation content eva thruster packs now relate correctly to the layer of equipment get out of here the layer of equipment players are wearing, meaning VFX will come from the thruster nozzles on armor pieces or backpacks instead of the undersuit. This is actually pretty key because at some point we're going to have both armor and undersuits that don't have any sort of um, thrusters on them. So you're going to have to actually pay attention to do you want an a sp sp God. do you want a specific type of armor that can carry more stuff or do more stuff or has more power? at the expense of not having control over your direction in space. Because in that sense, you might want to carry around a tractor beam to control yourself, or you might only be able to use your hands to crawl around. So like, it's just another kind of part of that risk versus reward, make a choice and deal with the consequences sort of gameplay that Star Citizen likes to build on and, and focus on. Um, for those of you who have been watching us play in the PTU, you've seen how this new model works. It's pretty good. It's very nice in the way that it frees up how your, your legs from banging into everything. It works smoothly. Everything about it is just completely different from the old one in that it works and it's enjoyable to use. This is one of the best additions of this pass, patch, I think. And, and I don't care if you think it's a visual change because it adds a lot of functionality. Improvements were made to how shop items are highlighted when players look at them and the positioning of AR cards was updated to account for mannequins and vehicles based on design's feedback. The team completed buy and rent interactions for physical shopping too. I like the new interactions, the, uh, the UI, I'm not crazy about it, but the, the new interactions, the animations, the sound effects, everything again feels like it's more of a game that I'm playing than a testing model. Gameplay features made further improvements to prone locomotions while additional support was added to animation to unlock animation asset production. For master modes, improvements to aiming and targeting for the gunnery system were completed and ESP saw further improvements, including smoother response to player input. If you're here regularly, you know that a lot of this stuff does end up in the game. But if you ever hear people tell you that like, hey, you don't know when that's coming to the game, it's not gonna come to the game. They're saying it, but it's years away. This stuff is actively in the patch notes. The month report is, is by far the best place to find out what's going on with this game before it gets made official. Well, I guess that is it getting made official, but you know what I mean. Throughout March, development continued on the resource network. As part of this, electromagnetic emissions are now based on power consumption, and infrared emissions are based around coolant and heat generation. This is exciting. Ph phenomenal that they're these systems being stuff that gets depicted by emissions means that stealth gameplay gets started. Um, it means that the size of ship you're using starts to be considered. Bigger is not always better. If you could carry a very valuable 20 million UEC item in the back of 100i from one system to another, but you have the opportunity to carry it in a caterpillar, you should choose the 100i because bigger is not always better. 100i gets by sneakier, it fits into more places, it also has a refinery so it's kind of got unlimited range, but like these are this is a big part of why ships aren't necessarily going to be pay to win. And, and I know that's a touchy topic. I guess more pay to progress 
it's just as much about the ship that you're choosing and, and, and as it is how you're using it. And the idea that if you are pumping more power or something like that, you get worse emissions, making you a little bit more vulnerable in a dangerous system. I'm all for that. And I think there was a little bit more on this too. Um, I think there was something else about the resource network here. Yeah, picking the right ship for the job. And you could see just how far back they were working on this. This is like 2020. They are working on this very simple sort of engineer debug based layout for the resource network is the most basic way you could get it you know they just had shapes for each thing they were connected through these little lines and that gave us an idea of where they wanted to go with it they put a lot of work into it and it's taken a while and it's come a long way and it's a little bit frustrating it's a little weird it might make you very nervous about the direction the game is going in but it's a system that they've been they've built the entire game sort of with the expectations that at some point this is how it's going to work. And uh, they'll have to dial it in. They'll have to figure it out. We're not getting the full implementation of it yet, so it'll probably feel a little weird with some holes missing. But this is kind of the quote-unquote sea of thievesing of, of Star Citizen, if you will. Where were we? The team also improved various debug tools and fixed bugs and supported the ongoing testing of an experimental Arena Commander mode. A temporary solution for ship hull pen penetration was added until Maelstrom is ready for to support physical ship armor. This is a big one that'll stop ships from dying so much. This system, they say, is subject to change as development and testing progresses, but currently all projectiles can deplete armor health. However, only ballistic weapons can penetrate the, the hull and damage internal components. We saw this during my engineering com um, session on the stream on Saturday. If you weren't at that stream, it is on the main YouTube channel. You can check it out. It's got like nine and a half hours of footage to scroll through, but it is there. You can see the ballistics flying through the ship. For life support, the team optimized the dynamic room atmosphere pressure uh, system and made it network compatible. Various improvements and refactors were also made to the room system and various debug tools were greatly improved to imp to allow the team to test the system before the player facing UI is complete. Life support should be interesting. How many of you are going to troll your friends just like take the oxygen out of their room while they're piloting the ship? <laughs> For transit, the team's primary focus in March was supporting cargo elevators and instanced hangars. Alongside general refactoring, this required adding hangar destination exporting, communication between the transit and instance managers for available hangars, the ability to dynamically add destinations to transit carriages, requests for the creation of hangars, and support for capturing peripherals in dynamically added hangars. This is basically all about making sure hangars get spawned correctly when you request a new place to land at a space station. Additionally, work began... Oh, okay. For radar and scanning, the team updated radar zone queries to use the new zone query time splice tech to improve performance. Additionally, work began on signature categories, which allow the team to apply different signature detections based on emitters. This can be used to independently detect components on a ship with higher emissions. For example, thrusters compared to offline shield generators. Again, huge stealth details. That's cr This is basically saying, hey, you want to fly through a space undetected? Get up to speed, shut down all your components, and fly dark. And, and somebody who's scanning via EM or IR might not even see you. And you could be a couple hundred kilometers away or a couple dozen kilometers away this is this is getting very cool i love the details that are going into how components work and how they operate with ships it's a little stealthy <laughs> no fucking pun intended it's a little stealthy how they're talking about these stealth improvements but i bet this is going to be a topic in um inside star citizen laser later this this year support was also provided on for the item port editor tool with a refactor of default item loadouts, including defining them directly in the item port parameters within the item port container in data core. I don't know what that means, item ports. Additionally, the team supported the, re the restoration of several core analytics and the reporting of additional key information to better understand player activity across the game. For Arena Commander, focus was closing Focus was on closing out deliverables for Alpha 323, most notably custom lobbies and the initial selection of custom settings. Gameplay features then continued to improve the multi-crew experience by adding access selection. Now, rather than either having multi-crew enabled or disabled, players can choose to enable the feature for friends and or squad members only. 
probably good. That's probably a good idea. <laughs> so you don't have people coming in and just engineering your ship to hell. Engineering refactored the team balancing system, removing layers of complexity that they had experimented with for Alpha 321 and 322. Oh, I see. No, never mind. This is for Arena Commander. The new system has a simple balancing logic that prioritizes keeping squads together. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my god, I feel like we get separated every match. A short delay has been added before balancing to allow for more players to connect. We still were in the PTU when we were trying. Uh, the teams were hard to get to work correctly. The team also improved loadout definitions, allowing them to create and edit slots for differing different ammo types, including consumables and utility ammo. They also created a variant of the salvage and repair multi-tool with, with filled canisters for use in the engineering experimental modes. Um, this didn't really work for us when we were trying it, but I, I see where they're going with it. This work also allows players to use their PU characters in Arena Commander. Players who have had a customized character will now utilize that rather than the default actor previously used. Thank God I can have my beautiful face in Arena Commander where I never see it. Okay, they worked on the engineering experimental mode with some UI work. Finally, the devs supported a new system for Gun Rush, allowing them to have multiple weapons lists that can be toggled on and off throughout a patch cycle. This provides more variety and the ability to test new weapon sets without waiting for a new patch. Yay! Gun Rush is pretty fun. Once the game can run at better than 20 frames per second in the Arena Commander for me, I will, I will check it out. March saw progress on reputation-based hostility, with the team fixing several issues with the new reputation system. Changes were also made to the trespass behavior. Now all factions will defend a trespass zone if it's owned by them, and factions with the appropriate settings will also be able to defend allied trespass zones. I didn't get to test this out, but we were at the distribution center, and they did kind of just shoot me. Rude. I wasn't even bad. I didn't even have a bad reputation. Let me see if I can find an interesting what they have to say about reputation, because they got cool plans for this. The difference with an organization is that they can have several career scopes. Look at all these reputations I have at max, look at what I'm able to maintain, all that. We're darn excited about how that's going to play out, potentially. So for this release, a lot of our focus is around missions and how that's going to be affecting things like your affinity and confidence. But going forward, you'll be having actions that affect your reputation of other kinds. So that's going to be things like a mission giver where you might push them, but it also could be like if you shoot at them or if you shove one of their friends or if you talk to them in the wrong way, if you choose a bad choice in a conversation tree. It could be any number of things. Um, we even have so, talked about some fun stuff where like Constantine Herson, for instance, is a bit of a snob. You walk in wearing a bad coat or like some weird clothes, he might think less of you. You can also key it off of things like when you happen to raid um, a ship that is controlled by maybe Crusader security. That's that's a pretty important one that people miss when they talk about, you know, you're not going to wear your helmet or you're going to be wearing a helmet all the time. You don't need to customize your character. Some people won't talk to you or might not give you the mission if you're wearing a spacesuit. You might want to actually switch into something that makes sense to go see them in. I'll let him say that again. Some fun stuff where like Constantine Herson, for instance, is a bit of a snob. You walk in wearing a bad coat or like some weird clothes, he might think less of you. You can also key it off of things like when you happen to raid um, a ship that is controlled by maybe Crusader security. We could key it off of something like you go into the wrong area. I mean, you just walk into a club where the bouncer doesn't want you to be there. We could key it off of you having the wrong decal on your ship or flying in a way that a person doesn't really think that you're flying in a cool way, essentially. It's very open-ended. One of the things that we're really looking forward to is giving flavor to organizations by essentially playing with what they like and don't like. So there might be an organization that really likes it when you go around PvPing and killing other players. There might be organizations that frown on that a little bit. There might be organizations that really, really like it when you do piracy or smuggling or illegal acts. And there might also be some that aren't so okay with that. And that feel is going to allow us to bring a lot of the lore that up until now has existed on a website into the game so that you guys can actually experience it and get to know these people in the universe. Still mostly on a website. Like most people don't know what we were even doing during the Overdrive initiative. So they need to work on this, but it is a goal. It's from 2021 few years back when the reputation was first coming into the game. But yeah, they're gonna, there's going to be a lot kind of built into the idea of how they see you and perceive you uh, based on what you do. 
Okay, for the Moby Glass, work continued on the redesign contract manager. Last month's work included adding a button to read or unread mission info and a toggle to switch between legal and illegal missions. I liked the idea somebody mentioned in chat here of having to go through a process of um, having to go through a process of getting access to illegal missions rather than just popping up on your Moby Glass by default. And I like that a lot more. Maybe giving players immediate looks at illegal missions isn't the best idea gameplay wise and maybe it doesn't make the most sense lore wise but i'm i'm sure you know they want to make sure that there is like the starter i don't know i i think there could be there they could do a very cool legal mission that turns into an illegal mission that ends up with you getting access to more illegal missions because you don't want to lock people out of having a an illegal handholdy step into that world it just feels weird having it be the first thing you see when you open your official, I don't know, government approved communications device. The team then made journal compatible with the new Moby Glass and updated the home screen, including added visuals for recent notifications, active missions, and the player's current jurisdiction and crime stat level. I dig the Moby Glass functionally wise. I feel like it's a little bit, a little bit not exactly the kind of like it's not it's not my favorite design style um but you know i see i see the direction they're going in and it's consistent that's all if it's consistent and it works i'm down for it so this is the new home screen they're talking about you can see they've got the notifications here contracts the health screen a new dedicated health screen as well and I think it's consistent, it's informative, it's functional, it's cool. Design-wise, it might not be my favorite, but I could care less, man. As long as it, it fits the game and it works and it does what they want it to do, I'm down for it. Improved debug tools were added to a cargo hauling to cargo hauling missions too, such as the ability to debug complete parts of the of the hauling order to simulate collecting or delivering freight elevators. Search or March saw progress on hangars, including the instance interior manager that handles instance logic and reserves gateways for transitioning between the outside world and hangar. Now players calling an elevator or retrieving a ship in supported locations will create an instanced hangar that the transit, air traffic control, and law systems correctly respond to. This is again more of that instancing technology in the background. Improvements were also made to the freight elevator kiosk, including the layout, branding, tooltips, delivery screen, and platform handling. The devs are currently integrating the kiosk with the personal inventory framework. The item bank is now functional and correctly uses the storage locker and updated delivery slash selection logic. And improvements were made to the warehouse system to support missions too. All this going into freight elevators and personal hangars and basically the, one of the biggest parts of 323. For the commodity kiosk, updates were made to the design along with the packing behavior and auto-loading display. Support was given to the lighting and VFX content teams towards ship loading platforms too. So good updates from the game, the core gameplay segment. Let's talk about economy though. Last month, the economy team continued rebalancing commodities, making sure they have a scalable algorithm that will work with other systems like crafting. Mission rewards are being rebalanced according to the difficulty and time required to complete them. As part of this, the team are working to better understand how much effort and time is required to perform specific activities in game. In-game pricing is currently underway for new Harvestable and Hangar Flare 2. Hangar Flare, cosmetics, economy is coming together. I think I'm going to make a video about this before 323 because it's a bit of a stealthy addition to 323 how much of the economy they're balancing now. Economy are currently involved in the design of reputation and org progression and are starting to balance the time and cost of auto-loading freight elevators. They also provided support for cargo missions. Finally, a comprehensive list of all intended resource and source Resource sources, terraformers, transformers, and sinks were created to help ensure the economy is stable for the long haul. Resource sources, transformers, and sinks. You know what this sounds like? Y'all know what that sounds like? Don't tell me you don't know. It sounds like some of this stuff here. Now it requires zero laronite. We're going to change that to two. And what we're going to very quickly see here is that we're going to start getting some laronite flowing to the Hurston factory so that the power plants can continue to be created. Transformers, producers, and sinks. And that's, that's, that, that's, that loop, that's that loop of guys right there. That's what they're taking. Um, now, 
one of the important things here is that the, let's go ahead and look at the Hurston aluminum. Bring Hurston factory aluminum. Now, what wound up happening there is it was very low for a period of time, and that's because they were actually burning off that aluminum inventory as fast as they could get it. And the reason why you see that spike there in the aluminum inventory is because as soon as we altered the formula so that power plants now require laronite, they were still receiving from all these freight, freight, freighter transports. They still had aluminum coming in, but they could no longer produce power plants. So it stalled, and then all of a sudden they started stockpiling, stockpiling. And then when you see that the aluminum started falling, that's because finally the, the, they started receiving supplies of laronite, and they were able to resume the production process. And so all of a sudden, their aluminum started getting burned off at a natural rate. Yeah. So now we're going to add a bit more laronite out in the asteroid fields, and Jake's going to handle that via macro. So they're basically they're showing off that you got R Corp, which is a shop. You got a, a Damar refinery, a Crusader refinery. These are examples of transformers, I think. A shop is an example of a sink. A Delamar mine is an example of a producer. So when I read this in the monthly report, I'm reading, they're getting together a list of all intended resource sources, transformers, and sinks. These are all of the refineries, the space stations, the shops, um, the outposts, the mining claims, every place in Stanton, and probably Pyro too, that creates all this stuff is basically getting tabulated so that they can start to maybe not even start to, maybe just continue to get it all organized so that when the quantum simulation actually can run and has the, the scale to do so, it just plugs in that data right here like this. That's the hope. That's not, I'm reading between the lines here. This isn't anything from CIG themselves, but it does sound like some of the more important economy stuff we've been waiting for in terms of supply and demand and dynamically changing things based on what's actually happening in the verse. Really cool to see. We're going to keep a close eye on the economy segment over the next few months because this might be a 4.0 targeted thing they're working on. Graphics, VFX programming, and Planet Tech. Throughout March, much of the department's focus was on bug fixing the various de deliverables for Alpha 323. Performance scaling options were added to the water simulation to ensure it can scale to all hardware while various improvements were made to water boundary shading and visor wetness to achieve a seamless effect as players enter water. Gotta get that visor wetness for the real game effect. Support for distanced field collisions were, was also completed for more accurate collisions from vehicles. The Vulcan team worked through several performance issues as they moved closer to matching the 3D performance. Uh, they had to say, this precedes the enabling of multi-threading for the next release to hopefully smash D3D performance levels on the CPU. The GPU performance should remain similar. However, some performance issues currently remain, so depending on the location and context, players may see worse performance, hence the beta label on Vulkan. But the aim is for us to, to get widespread testing in Alpha 323 so that we can enable Vulkan by default in the following release. That's what we're seeing right now with the Evocati update coming later today. They are enabling Vulcan in the game so that you can use it, but they won't be making it mandatory, or not mandatory, they won't be making it a default rendering system in the game until the next release, probably 3.24 or 4.0. Alongside the Vulcan render, the team are currently reworking shaders to reduce the total number of PSOs that need compiling when the game starts. Work on global illumination also continued with a focus on performance as the team moved toward an internal rollout of the first version for testing by the art teams. Global illumination's coming along this year. We're about to get upscaling, the Vulcan renderer, global illumination, and possibly even frame interpolation all within a year of each other. The optimizations, mmm, yummy. Not to say that the game's just magically gonna run better, but like, those are pretty big steps in the optimization realm, if if I know any better. I don't know better, so, you know, somebody else in chat may, may confirm. 
The Planet Tech team started working on Planet Tech V5, with initial focus on the groundwork required to set up spatial partitioning. They're currently deciding how this will work with server meshing and server crash recovery. The devs also introduced the concept of default planets for the internal editor so that it's trivial for anyone to create and use a planet for testing. Man, I can't believe they didn't have that already. Um, they're not talking about the shiny parts of Planet Tech V5 yet, and I'm wondering what they are. They keep talking about more the angle of, this is going to help us make planets better. Yes, but how will it make them shinier? On the VFX programming side, in addition to water improvements, the team continued with networking support for the fire simulation. They're also making changes to the augmented reality render layer to enable support for holographic lenses or weapons. Sorry. So water and fire. That's good fun. Fire is going to be an interesting one on these ships. Muzzle flashes, projectiles, enemies, and impacts all getting holographic support. The in-game branding and locations teams work together on Invictus launch week with work approaching completion. The branding work for cargo containers and additional signage for various locations is also nearly finished. In interactables last month, item banks now called gear storage were finished, including a heavily worn version for Grimhex. They were then placed around the verse for convenient access. Pictures aren't loading again. Don't do this to us. Let's move on to locations. Last month, saw the locations team polishing content for Alpha 4.0. They also closed out the upcoming distribution centers, adding content and quality to give players the best possible experience on launch. They also kicked off pre-production for new mandates, officially beginning in Q2. Yay! I love new mandates. We get to hear about these next, next quarter in monthly reports. The Landing Zone team finalized art for instanced hangars and prepared them for implementation across the verse. That's, we've, we've been hearing about that. Eyeballs, moist eyeballs. All right, mission design. This is where, this is actually, I think, a new one. Yeah, mission feature team was restructured. So this is where we get to hear about some, uh, some good fun. Oh boy. Last month, the mission feature team was restructured, becoming the mission design team. Despite the name change, the team will continue to build scalable modular content for the PU. It's like, dis despite their not having features in the name anymore, there are still features involved, believe it or not. Following feedback on the Overdrive Initiative event, the team is revisiting, revisiting the standard data heist missions. Currently, these missions are locked to a single player who can then share the mission with their friends, which causes a bottleneck for the missions and locations. In response, the team are trialing a change that will allow a singular version of the mission to be accepted by four players who will play together as contractors. This is an effort to free up missions and locations and create a similar effect to, to Overdrive Initiative where people who usually play solo are part of a team, potentially building friendships and enhancing the MMO feeling. <laughs> this will be after after Reputation does a better job of making sure people don't just shoot each other. <laughs> I mean, I guess if you have negative rec, you're not going to get these these missions. Actually, wait a second. The Data Heist mission, isn't that an illegal mission? So, like, are you trying to pair up a bunch of people who naturally like shooting folks into parties in which they're not supposed to shoot folks? Work progressed on the upcoming cargo hauling missions, with players being tasked with hauling tracked goods from one location to another as requested by a shipping company, with a consistent payout of roughly 20% of the cargo's value. A hauler's income will be more stable than that of a commodity trader who buys low and sells high as the market fluctuates. Still... Once a cargo hauler gets comfortable with the professions, they might try their luck at community trading. So one of you had mentioned this, uh, somebody was asking about this. How, how are they gonna do it? Are they gonna force you to always buy the cargo and then ship it? Or are they gonna let you take a contract that has you working for a company? The contracts are how you're going to build up your reputation, get more advanced missions, get specific trade routes that send you on specific missions. I just said that. The trader version of this is going to be about buying a material right this is literally what we were just watching in this video buying a material at a certain place waiting for that price to maybe spike or for that stuff to become more valuable and then selling it off at a different place when you realize that they're going to pay more for it that's where those commodity price changes in the moby glass started out that was kind of their first version of trying to get that going they want to apply that to all these locations they're talking about so there's going to be a lot going into into the cargo hauling profession, and uh, like I said, I'll have a video coming out about that tomorrow. While the player is legally allowed to transport the goods, this is talking about those commodity trading missions you could get assigned to you. This is actually the coolest part, in my opinion. 
While the player is legally allowed to transport those goods, they don't actually own them, right? You're just getting paid to transport. As a result, lawful stores across Stanton won't even buy those commodities if you try and take them and sell them somewhere else. To sell the to sell this shipment rather than delivering it, the player must navigate to a fence. So now these are different kinds of contacts in different places in the game. A no questions asked shop, often located in an unmonitored space of Stanton. However, due to its tracked nature, this cargo fetches a significantly lower price than original or ordinary sandbox commodities. And this will apply across different star systems and stuff too. So this is a big detail in the cargo hauling profession that's saying, even if you decide to take a contract, right? You sign up with an NPC organization and you're basically just running a standard mission. At any point during that mission, maybe you'll get an offer, not even just from an NPC. Maybe a player will approach you and say, hey, if you transport, if you transfer all that stuff out of your shipping into mine, because right, we've got the physical transportation. This isn't just like some kind of value that gets placed to your ship and then you take that to, to another space station and then your ship magically transports the cargo. These are cargo boxes physically put on your ship that at any point you could take, give to another player and they could go sell it. Now, this can kind of move into the realms of fraud. And I also think there are there are considerations to make here, like can you transport it to a third party place and then have your friend pick it up and continue that transport to the place where the mission is assigned to? Or is that cargo always going to be assigned to your ship? Like there's a lot of permissions questions I have about this stuff, but it opens up the game a ton when you can just kind of break into a mission and finish it out in a different way than, than what they had planned. So I look forward to seeing how that works with the sandbox gameplay and what they decide to do there, but it's a lot. With the upcoming addition of Wildlife to the PU, Mission Design began working on related content, building three mission variants. There's the kill X amount of animals, I guess. This extermination population control mission tasks players with killing a predetermined amount of animals on a planet. So you could just fly around your Cutlass helicopter style, sniping these animals from the sky in different biomes. There's also clear location, which will require you to go to a specific location that requires having its animal population dealt with. Then there's kill and collect, requiring you to go to first, uh, basically the first resource collection mission type where players must locate animals and collect their resources, which is preferably not poop. Following a recent hire, some older mission modules were refactored as such the destroy illegal satellites mission received a small facelift. That's good. Wonder what that is. Following further testing of Blockade Runner, a small change was made to ensure that events stay fun and engaging for all players. Work on the Xenothreat Global events continued too, alongside freight elevators. Narrative. Last month, Narrative continued to work closely with design to support a variety of content, from revising existing missions like the new player experience to outlining new missions being developed to support upcoming gameplay. The team continued to iterate on future narrative initiatives designed to bring more characters and stories to the verse, this resulted in a series of proposals that they've been reviewing with design. They also continued to outline ways to improve AI behaviors to sell more on the Star Citizen lore. Narrative also met with some of the gameplay teams to talk over the lorification of upcoming systems. They're, they're starting to dip a lot more into the narrative stuff, which is great because, as you can see from the current event that's going on, narrative it doesn't do the best job like in the game. There's so much lore in this game that you just don't even get to really know about because it's all hidden behind narrative stuff. Um, but even just looking at their their recent talks here about branding, um, clearly they're trying to get more into selling the places. Definitely like look at, they're just applying a lot more to the actual areas. And they came in um, and to the narratives, the missions and stuff. We just need more voice acting. We need more presence. We need more stuff that convinces people that they're actually taking part in a game, in a universe, rather than just marking some boxes on a list, you know? Here's what they're saying, though. Really develop, like, all the layers that you need for it to feel real. That was something that, uh, you know, is very rich and is extremely fun to bring forward with the visuals and the branding. And at that point, it's... It's more than branding, it becomes like storytelling, basically, right? You're telling a story through all the elements that you're putting on the walls and in the environment that help sell the lore and, again, augment immersion and the experience for the player. Defining the factions 
that we found in like in Checkmate Station by the, the, the Rough and Ready was a lot of fun. Creating that the identity of a faction, a gang, right? Um, in space, in, in, in a derelict, abandoned station in the middle of nowhere. I think you really get a vibe when you, when you get there. When you enter the, the zone, like you, right away you know it's, it's rough and ready. They, they made the logo like a big sculpture, so I thought this was pretty cool from like where it started to where it's at now. I think the graffiti and the sculpture does it mostly. had the opportunity to work with the character team to define a little bit of the uh, tattoos that go in line with the direction that we had, you know, for the type of faction we wanted this, this gang to look like. I started the brainstorm around tattoos, which were all uh, bring a bit of, like, uh, violence and of contrast right. on parts kind of the Kind of just sell design. sort of what they're doing with branding. You can also see it back here. They talk about like how the ships, the manufacturers are all starting to get more into their categories and what they're supposed to look like. So a history of the brand, basically. A little bit what they're about, uh, a tagline. So this is where, you know, we're collaborating with the narrative team to to come up with these uh, the information for this. And then that is the first, the, the, the starting point. That's all part of the, uh, the brand style guide. A style guide is for everyone to really get to understand the company and we, you try to keep it simple, but you put all the elements you need, like the logos, the colors, you're allowed to use the typography that goes with that company, even shapes. Every company has colors. If the primary color is blue, let's say you can't, you can't go out and do like branding for that company or make it like red, you know? So we're all trying to like tie everything together to make sure everybody's on the same page. Now this kind of sounds like they're just starting this. They did do this for a while. They, I don't. I just don't think they had it. I think a lot of the full company organization is only just coming together over the last several years or the last few years because a lot of the time they just haven't even had enough people on the teams in the PU to, to put the extra work towards this stuff. A lot of their effort went towards Squadron 42 and before, and I guess during that too, a lot of the effort was just about building the game, the base of the game, the the engine itself, the technology that drives it. And that's where we're starting to see a little bit more focus on narrative and branding in the game itself, finally. I hope that continues and speeds up too, because definitely need more back, backdrop. Online technology team said in March, the online services team worked towards refactoring the social services backend. This involves porting the services to gRPC, as well as making updates for server meshing. The team are currently working to reduce a EAC anti-cheat false positives in preparation of enabling sanction enforcement. Lastly, online services finished, uh, finished off long-term persistence work for the character customizer, enabling players to save their characters between patches. This is in 3.23. So, uh, a solid addition for sure. I think that's a big one for the character customizer. R&D. In March, work continued on the temporal render mode. Render mode? Render node? Render mode. Tracking movement of objects moving through clouds was improved so that history can be rejected or kept as correctly as possible. A novel method was developed because typical disocclusion algorithms only work for opaque scenes. But the team, want, uh, the team wants objects to fly through transparent clouds, be partially occluded by clouds and fog, and etc. The generation and blending of soft depth, of soft depth for clouds and atmosphere was improved. Uh, this depth information is crucial to properly handling history rejection when moving through clouds. A lot of cloud cloud stuff going on here. It is the clouds look great, by the way. What we saw in the 323 PTU the other day when we turned on reference was holy crap, it was beautiful, and we were running at pretty good frames too for Star Citizen. I am the the looks of this game are taking a step up. It's it, it's funny because we've heard year after year how this game is not going to look good when it releases and year after year, the engine team is able to continue to improve the graphics because they own the engine and uh, they're still working on it. It's not like a big graphics overhaul like 3.0. I don't think they need that now, but they are doing some of the more mature stuff like DLSS and um, FSR and their own TSR and a lot of the lighting stuff that's going on, ray trace and global illumination. They still have that, that kind of stuff to get into the game. The team also supported the Gen 12 Vulcan Endeavor by analyzing the current lists of pipeline state objects used to render the game and suggested several ways to reduce it. 
These suggestions are being worked on by the Grender team and will result in a short end shader pre-cache phase the first time players start the game. Yeah, thank God. I hope they can get that to work in the launcher too. Tech design support supported various areas of development to prepare for Alpha 323 and beyond. This included item banks with the team making a, ne a new rundown variant entity, setting up state machines and animations and iterating on the main screen and player interaction points and flow. Hangers were supported alongside ship flight, including iteration on new AI behaviors to make them more responsive to player actions. Master modes received polish too. Support was given to QA for visual scripting automation and nodes were added for getting and setting player stats. For UI, player stats, I wonder what that means. For UI, tech design worked on test level setup and FPS crosshairs and hit markers, updating and polishing animations and fixing bugs. General bug fixing was also done and various tools and workflows received improvements. I hope you can make those, those hit markers smaller because they are very large. Last month, the Montreal-based UI team worked closely with the core gameplay team and the UI teams on the new cargo gameplay updates. This effort encompasses the development of the new freight elevator kiosk, commodity kiosk, and item bank. They also began preparing mandates coming later this year, including the resource network and jump points. <laughs> the UK-based team focused on adding the new player-facing UI to the game. The new version of the Moby Glass was made fully functional in time to get player feedback with visual polish still ongoing, as we can see. The new visor and lens received visual improvement while the last functionality elements were ported over by the programming team. UI also continued to polish the new shopping UI and character customizer ready for release. Not the biggest fan of how the character, the uh, shopping UI looks, but I do love the functionality of it and, it and it feels good to use. On the VFX side of things, last month the VFX team finished their work on distribution centers and freight elevators. They also completed tasks for several upcoming vehicles. Progress continued on jump point effects, including concepting based on new gameplay considerations that became apparent during testing. Hmm. So they are actively developing the gameplay around jump points, not just get into a jump point, fly to the other system and you're done. Like they are working on the gameplay elements, how to make it more interesting, how to really develop it out to make it um, not just a transition between servers, but a full on experience that's part of the game. The team took another look at water effects to coincide with the graphics team's plans to release some of the water improvements that were shown at CitizenCon. We are getting some of the water improvements, uh, but that does sit and tell me that they've got more plans for it, which I think we could all imagine that. And that's the report. That is the report, my friends. This was a good one, in my opinion. A lot of little things here and there, the details on the cargo stuff. This is like the first details we've gotten on what's actually going on with cargo changes in 323. We know overall what they want to do, but this is the first time they've actually <laughs> put it down in writing. The ship news was fairly standard. Nothing too crazy. We know that the Zeus is getting worked on. Legionnaire is getting worked on. They didn't mention a lot of the other stuff that was going on last month, which includes like the Polaris and a couple of other unnamed things, one of which is most likely going to go straight to flyable during, during 323. We don't really know yet, but they've teased us a couple of things and I think it's pretty likely since there hasn't been anything about any ships yet this entire year. So yeah, that, that about wraps it up. This was a good report though. <laughs>